Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Today, we've got a featuring the splashdown of Skylab 4, the third crewed mission to America's first space station on this date, February 8th, 1974. There's three astronauts in there that just spent a record 84 days in America's big space station. They were the last crew to go up there. We'll talk all about them on this date. And we're going to celebrate on this Black History Month three really neat astronauts that made an impact during the shuttle era today. So uh, Marty Winkle, my cameraman co-producer, is going to have, I'm going to make him do a little bit old school camera work as we zoom in on some of the uh, swag that we have from the Gemini 4 mission. And um, Marty, how you doing? Good to have you in today. I sorry I I pressed everything to the last minute today. I'm doing good, Mark. And uh, well, good, good. You all know I work out good under pressure. Our executive director Karen Conklin, who runs this museum, was in here previewing our program today. And though I am the uh, outreach person for our museum. Karen's our executive director and does a great job. She's been passionate about this museum for over almost 20 years. And uh, Mar Marty and I, I came in about five years ago. Marty, you've been involved with the museum for 15 years or more, haven't you not? Uh, how about 1997, I think, or 96? Excellent. And not on a, not on a daily basis like like now, <laughs> yeah. Like now is our my uh, our co-producer for Stay Curious, and hope you like my T-shirt. That was a gift from Karen. Maybe we'll put those together and sell them to y'all one day out there. And uh, any of you that we owe a T-shirt to from the Cali Beautiful Art, we've got those ordered, and you're going to get them very soon. So yes, well, Marty, they, they came in today. They came in today. Okay. All right. Whew. Sorry about the delay, but we'll be sending those out tomorrow then to those that we owe the pictures to, or the uh, Cali Art t-shirts, and we'll have more to sell, and we'll put that up also. So, well, we've got a bunch of stuff going on at the American Space Museum we're proud of. Our Shuttle Fest 2 event is going to be April 15th, a Saturday, at the Hyatt Place Hotel in Titusville, where we had Shuttle Fest 1. We're going to feature the mobile launch platform documentary called Base to Space and have some people that were engineers and designed the mobile launch platforms. One of the niches of importance of the space shuttle era, the, the, the big base platform that everything roared into space off of. So we'll be, of course, talking a lot more about that as time goes on and get your speaker list lined up there. But this is here to stay for our museum the weekend closest to the April 12th launch of space transportation number one. We're going to have a shuttle fest, and we hope it grows with your participation. Also, Charity Space Memorabilia Auction. I'll have to put up a different uh, uh, image for that. Uh, is uh, a week from Saturday, November 18th. We will have over 400 items to be auctioned off. None of this is our collection. This is either consignments from people like Marty, who has consigned a lot of things from his Grumman swag memorabilia, building the lunar module, uh, or it's items that we have multiples of and would never use them again in our museum. An opportunity to own astronaut autographs, space phone, flown flags, and items such as that, or just find a rare patch or complete your collection of astronaut autographs with one that you've been looking for. So that will be a week from Saturday, November 18th, starting at noon. You may bid now online by going to American Space Museum's website. You'll see the auction tab at the top up there. And while you're looking at our American Space Museum page up at the top is a little donate button if you care to get a tax deduction this tax season. Uh, we're the nonprofit that would love to send you a form and say that you gave us some tax deductible money. So uh, that is who we are, a nonprofit that has been preserving the birth of the American space age for the last 20 years, all to inspire the next generation of space workers. And we're so proud to have a bunch of kids in here every day 
uh, learning some uh, STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math education from Darren Roberts, our education coordinator. We have quite a great program going on here, and one day we'll have Darren on here to talk about it. Uh, the lineup for the rest of the week, we apologize that Mr. Hugh Harris couldn't be here today. Uh, he had uh, a conflict, but uh, tomorrow we're going to have Steve Lloyd. Uh, he grew up in the space program. His dad, Marty, is 96 years old and worked on the Apollo program. Steve uh, also worked on the shuttle, was involved with the transoceanic abort landing sites, as well as decommissioning Discovery for its uh, display at the Udvar Hazy Museum of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So we look forward to having Steve, who's an executive vice president for All Points, a company that we're going to learn about on Stay Curious as we have Steve on a couple more times. And Steve is also one of our esteemed board members of the American Space Museum. So we got to be on our best behavior tomorrow, Marty, board member in the house. We're always on our best behavior. You are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I guess I'll have to get some uh, discipline from the boss before Steve goes on here. No, we're going to have a great time. Steve's an awesome guy. Got a great... Uh, uh, his son works out there. Three generations. Uh, and then uh, Thursday, Friday, we'll do some Stargazer Mark Backyard Constellations. The moon will be rising. Uh, late in the evening, like at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So you can see Orion, uh, Gemini, Taurus the Bull, Cassiopeia the Queen. We'll talk about all of them on Friday. And go back and look at what we've talked about this week. Gary Allgaier yesterday was just phenomenal. Gary, thank you for a great job on talking about the 11 Defense Department missions of the shuttle. He was involved in about six of them very intimately. That was an interesting conversation, wasn't it, Marty? I think so. I really enjoyed it. Learned a little bit also. And we're going to expand more on the Defense Department missions of the shuttle flown mostly in the 1990s that helped change the attitude of the United uh, Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republic uh, and um, as they became russia because of some of these dod missions so well we're glad that you're along with us today black history month is of course the month of february we love celebrating our african-american astronauts as we are just about 10 miles from the birth of the civil rights movement the uh harry and harriet uh, moore center in mims where this couple were blown up and killed christmas night 1951, uh, and definitely that was uh, uh, preceded some of the earlier uh, civil rights movement things. So, uh, but uh, we do have a lot of a lot of friends and partners in the museum, and uh, they're just all brothers and sisters in space, men, women of any color. And uh, first up, we're going to talk about Alvin Drew. Was born November 5th, 1962, in Washington D.C. Uh, he's been on two shuttle flights. The first was STS-118 to the International Space Station in August 2007. And then his second flight was the last one of STS-133, the last flight of Discovery that we play over and over here. The launch and landing and, and on our 10-minute uh, display at our actual consoles that fueled the space shuttle. Um uh, Drew became the 200th person to walk in space uh, when he conducted the first uh, uh, STS-133 spacewalk with fellow astronaut Steve Bowen. Uh, there is a, a little poster that's been done for him, uh, decorated colonel in the U.S. Air Force, 25 years of service, uh, 600 hours in space, and 12 hours of spacewalks. That's about two spacewalks there. There he is with Katie Coleman having a big time uh, uh, before or after one of his spacewalks there. Katie's on Facebook a lot, you Facebookers on there. There she's got a nice Nikon camera. Uh, Drew, like I said, was born in Washington, D.C., but he moved to Brooklyn, uh, Washington area, uh, and he recalls uh, seeing the Apollo 7 launch at the age of five and wishing that he could be an astronaut. 
there in 1968. Uh, 25 Days in Space. And we've got him here with astronaut Nicole Stott uh, when she was on Expedition 20. Now, that's their 133. Yes, they flew together on uh, 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 133 in February uh, 2024. Uh, and uh, not 2024, February 24th, 19, that had been 2011 was that mission. So there were crewmates on there. Nicole, a great friend of our museum. And uh, uh, what else did Drew do? Two spacewalks on this, the 200th person. And uh, he is today founded the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, a branch of the Brooke Owens Fellowship intended to provide resources for African-American students uh, in undergraduate pursuits of aerospace. So uh, he is active in doing things today in space, uh, promoting for the youth and so forth. So glad to feature Alvin Drew. Golly, he's just... Um, born in 62 he's just in his 60s there so uh, he's got a lot to, that he can share with us hope he's out there someday and then here in the white room is leland melvin leland devon melvin american engineer there he is in the white room that's our travis thompson there you can see some of travis's stories on our uh, stay curious youtube channel um melvin uh Grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. He was a wide receiver for the University of Richmond uh, football team, actually drafted by the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Uh, he has some records uh, at Richmond. Uh, I think the most catches uh, played. They were the Richmond Spiders, all right? And uh, his best year was 65 catches for almost 1,000 yards and eight touchdowns. So uh, quite a football player. He blew out his knee uh, in spring training for the Dallas Cowboys and then his hamstring and that ended his professional career. But it didn't end there. There he's shown on an expedition crew uh, uh, enjoying um, uh, his weightless experience there. Let's see. Drew loves seeing this picture of working with kids. He's a big outreach uh uh, and since retiring from NASA, let's see how, how much he's got. 23 days in space, two missions, right? 122 and 129. He did, uh, he appeared uh, on the 12th episode of Top Chef with his dogs in the seventh season of Doug, Dog Whisper. And uh, he's been on a lot of dog things. He loves dogs. You're going to see why here in just a second, as he loves kids with STEAM education. And there's his two dogs there that uh, he dearly loves, Tr Jake and Scout. All right. I think they've gone across the dog rainbow bridge because this would have been 2011, 2010, somewhere in there, uh, or 2009. And... Uh, our uh, suit tech friend, Sharon McDougall, who is the lady in Houston responsible. We're going to see a picture of her in a minute. She told us, Marty, when we had her on that um, she was flipped out by these dogs being in there because if they clawed the space suit and put a tear in it, she was going to be the one to have to fix it. And she said that Leland had to get all kinds of clearance there at Johnson Space Center in Houston to get these dogs on the set during the photo op which you have a photo op for the crew and an individual. But this is quite a famous picture, uh, the love of his dogs there. And they're, they're not Weimarangers. I forget the name of them. But he's on a, anything that has to do with dogs on TV, he's been on, including the Netflix series Dogs. And the, uh, he was on the seventh season of Dog Whisperer. And uh, this guy is so talented. He plays the piano. He's also on on uh, Facebook quite a bit. And thank you, uh, Leland Melvin, for liking our occasional posts on our American Space Museum Facebook site. He pops up once in a while on there. Uh, since retiring from NASA, uh, Leland, um, he reaches a wide variety of, of audiences, including talking about his NFL career. Um, 
He recovered from a serious uh, ear injury where doctors stated uh, the possibility of him being deaf, and it, which affects his left ear. He's published two books, Chasing Space, an astronaut story of grit, grace, and second chances, and Chasing Space, Young Reader's Edition. So those of you that love astronaut biography, there's two for, two for you there. And he is quite active uh, and actually... Uh, is in the Lynchburg area quite a bit where his parents live. And of course, astronauts usually keep close ties to the Houston area where they trained all those years. So, all right, our last astronaut on, we're gonna celebrate on uh, Black History Month is Mr. Charlie Bolden. And Charlie Bolden, uh, we got a comment there first before we get into Charlie. Yeah, the Leland's dogs were Rhodesian Ridgebacks. Okay, Rhodesian Ridgebacks. All right, thank you, Marty. I kind of had that at the tip of my tongue. <laughs> I said the uh, Chesapeake's Rhodesian. Yeah, thanks for looking that up. They're beautiful. Well, Charlie Bolden, born in um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, the fabulous Science Museum at Columbia has uh, some of his swag in there. I've been in that museum. I love that museum right on uh right off interstate 26. uh he graduated from the navy academy uh and uh his uh he had an illustrious career as twice a commander and then twice a pilot in uh the early shuttle era i'll even say 61c and 86 was his first mission and then of course after the challenger accident uh 31 in 1990 45 he was commander of in 92 in 60 and 94. Uh, Charlie was the first person to ride the slide wire baskets, uh, which enabled rapid escape from the space shuttle. Uh, they needed someone to human test it. He happened to be there. Uh, they didn't uh, really, uh, that astronauts didn't train and do that every, every time they were up there during their uh, all outs test uh, a couple weeks before the launch. Uh, what else about this uh, great Marine here? He's a hoorah Marine, Marty. Uh, more than 100 sorties in North and South Korea and Cambodia and those A-6A intruders. Quite a uh, maneuverable, stealthy little plane. Uh, and uh, he is highly decorated. Uh, of course, being an African-American pilot and then a commander, uh, a pioneer at doing that. Uh, and then uh, he um, was appointed by President Barack Obama as administrator of NASA, all right, from 2009 to 2017. And uh, that was a good administrator, Marty, coinciding with Bob Cabana, uh, the director of the Kennedy Space Center, and turning that into a uh, pay for for launch type of facility, let's put it that way, where we've got Blue Origin and SpaceX, of course, uh, leasing uh, great space out there and, and opening up those pads for the young startups of our, our great new space renaissance. And Charlie, like I said, uh, that, that area of Columbia, South Carolina is his home. Beautiful area there. He's got two kids uh, and... Uh, Saw him pictures of him recently. He's rocking a beard. So uh, there's some. There he is in the um, commander's side, the left seat of one of those orbiters. And there he is with Sharon McDougall. She was so proud. She said, uh, being an African American herself, uh, suiting him up. She was actually sort of the tailor for the astronauts, though they don't get their individual pumpkin suit for launch and re-entry. There's a small, medium, and large. We have one in our museum that has been space flown six times in there. So uh, Sharon McDougall there, good shout out to her during Black History Month as she suits up Charlie Duke, uh, one of our great commanders and Charlie a great, uh, pardon me? Charlie Bolden, not Charlie Duke. Oh, I, yeah, Charlie Duke, I said. Charlie Bolden, one of our great commanders of the space shuttle and a very good NASA administrator for eight years. Well, we're going to segue from that into the history books of 49 years ago. Skylab 4 landed in the ocean uh, behind me here. But Mark, it says 
Skylab 3 on the patch. But the astronauts are right. All right. Carr, Gibson, and Pogue. Uh, well, let's just get into that a little bit, okay? The first rookie commander uh, since Neil Armstrong and Gemini 8 in 1966 was Jerry Carr. He was joined in space uh, by William Pogue and science pilot Ed Gibson, who's now 86 years old. They docked uh, to the Skylab space station, and they were the third crew to do it, and they stayed there in November 1973 till February 8, 1974. Yes, the patch has a three on it. That's because the engineers considered Skylab 1 the launch of the space station itself and Skylab 2, the first crew. The NASA Public Relations Department didn't get the memo from the engineers, literally. I have even talked to Hugh Harris, who was in the public affairs office at the time, and he said, well, the confusion, yeah, was like that. So people like Marty that worked, uh, of course, on the Grumman lunar modules and engineer, and then later on the space shuttle engines, um, as a computer manager, he would be calling it Skylab 4. And you know what? Most of us call the last mission Skylab 4 easily because when you say Skylab 3, oh, do you mean the one with Carr, Gibson, and Pogue? Or do you mean the one Skylab 3 that the engineers call 3 that was Al Bean was the commander of that? So um, it can be confusing, but there's their patch. This was a science mission, a lot of solar astrophysics being done on Skylab. You'll see here in a minute, it was configured as a telescope to study the sun. You've got the rainbow there and the human being uh, for everybody's uh, uh, health. And then they even investigated plant life and so forth up on Skylab 3 the uh, or Skylab 4, if you want to call it that. The mission extended at the time the record for humans in space. It was launched on November and here is Tom Usiak, a teenager in those days in 1974. Tom coming down for his college paper. What a gorgeous picture that is, Marty, of the whole uh, scaffolding there, the what you call the LUT, correct? The uh, launch umbilical tower on the right. Correct, right. And then the left is just a structural... Uh, the mobile service structure. Mobile service structure there. And then here it's on top of a um, uh, a little stool, milk stool they called it, because that's actually the, the S-1B rocket of the Saturn configuration. There it is venting as Tom Usiak captured this the night before the uh, or the morning of the launch. On film, a very difficult shot uh, and a great shot there because Tom didn't blow the highlights out of the Saturn rocket there and there's tom's liftoff of it thank you buddy for sharing that give me a call tonight we'll catch up but uh yes instead of uh lowering the tower down to a smaller because this wasn't going to the moon you only needed one stage rocket to put them into to orbit there and then uh or up to the 20 miles and then the second stage would take them uh up to orbit and um uh, the next to the last command module, once assigned to the canceled Apollo 20 mission, would stay in space longer than any command module. So this was a big consideration. There are the guys there. Jerry Carr on the left. We lost him a couple years ago. Ed Gibson in the middle is 86 years old. We've been efforting him from time to time to get him on Stay Curious. I want to talk about the two books he wrote, uh, uh, fiction books. One is called uh, Reach, and the other is, um, uh, what is the other name of that? In the Nick of Time, or uh, Ed Gibson's other book is called the Raw, In the Wrong Hands. Yeah, had to get that out. Uh, with three rookies, Skylab 4 was the largest all-rookie crew launched by NASA. Following the all-rookie Mercury program, there were only five more all-rookie flights. Gemini 4 with Ed White. And Jim McDivitt was the commander. Gemini 7, those were two rookies, Borman and Lovell. Gemini 8 was rookie, uh, Armstrong and Scott. And then Skylab 4 in 19 uh, was a rookie crew. And then 1981, STS-2 had two rookies, Joe Engel and Richard Truly. So uh, 
The crew continued the science program begun by the two previous missions. All right. And uh, there is the splashdown 49 years ago. Actually, that is Skylab 3 came down. Uh, that, uh, I think that's the second crew. But either way, that's what the configuration looked like of the command module coming back. It flipped over, as you can see in my picture here of our green screen, uh, designed to flip over from the buoyancy. Imagine you go, you're go, you orbiting the Earth for all those days or on the moon, and you come back, and the first thing, you land in the ocean, and you're going to get seasick. You're going to barf into a bag, probably, and be shook around upside down. And that's why those balloons are on the left to upright it. This is the same system now that is being used by the Crew Dragon of SpaceX. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll outside of it looking a little little different configuration it's the same concept there but what's cool about spacex is they've got that boat that they just draw, drive up to it and put a hoist on it and pull it in and uh, uh yes so alex carl he knows that our europe isa eurocom uh, alex carl been in communication with him and going to try to he was on the last crew dragon recovery and we're looking at the Gru dragon six going up uh february 26 here just a couple weeks well there is the crew uh car and pogue grew beards all right uh and uh obviously ed gibson shaved his on there uh but these were one of the first crews to grow a beard in space and then come back with it a couple of Apollo astronauts did that. Mike Collins came back with a mustache from Apollo 11. All right. So we want to show you a little bit of the Skylab. Uh, there is the command module uh, number. Uh, what was the command module number? I do know it. Command module number. I want to say 22, Marty. Uh Oh, it's written down here. The command module, and there's a good story about that here we're going to get to. During this uh, mission, well, there it is. It had to be 84 days, all right. So you had to keep this thing alive in the reentry heat shield and all that sort of stuff on there. The service module is needed to keep the avionics uh, working and so forth. Um CSM, that's going to drive me nuts if I find that. CSM, I want to say 22 is the, the, the tail number on that. Um, eight, 118, I'm sorry, there it is, 118. North American Rockwell's 118. So those engineers were hoping it was going to uh, be functional, and it did. All right, and that became the longest crewed uh, vehicle to be in space ever until it was surpassed by the Crew uh, 1 astronauts on Crew uh, SpaceX Dragon Resilience, all right? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, Doug Forrest is watching. Dave Stangy, thank you for watching, guys. Gary Gerald, there is the cavernous, all right, Skylab. Marty, I'm going to, while you're up, let's do a little bit of zooming in on some swag here. Let's get uh, uh, Marty... Uh, Zooming in there a little bit. We're going to show you some swag. Here's that cavernous thing. There is Ed White doing an EVA on the outside. And go back to our old school stuff. Uh, look at my, my messy desk here. But that's all right. All of this good stuff here. I'll put that over there. Yes, they would do these beautiful little... Um, and I got my old school thing that we made to just show you things the way we used to do it. Uh, here's a Skylab uh, decal. They would have these little decals of the Skylab that they would post. This says team member, all right, man's flight awareness, uh, uh, MFA. This is a cool little patch to have. Of course, there's the decal of the, uh, the crew. Skylab team member. These were bumper stickers, okay. Uh, that That's... Uh, and then uh, information for guests, all right? So this was for viewing the launch, all right? So you would go, here is your Skylab Parkway, Skylab 4, sedan, 
and station wagon permit, okay? I wonder when the last station wagon rolled off the assembly line in Detroit, Marty. <laughs> that, that's a good one, wouldn't it? They were prior to the SUVs, which is kind of like our modern type of uh, station wagon. Yeah. Did you have a station wagon? Yeah. No. No. Uh, this is Charles Buckley, the great security officer. Always want to find out more about him. Uh, his name's on, on millions of those things. They would show you where to park. Okay. This was for the North Parkway viewing site. All right. Uh, and uh, then, uh, then you would work on Skylab and get this a little appreciation thing. Uh, there's all three of the insignias there, okay, from left to right. Skylab 1 is the one on the left, the Skylab patch in the top, and then the right is Skylab 2 and, and 3 there. So the engineers put another number on. Here's the flight awareness uh, reception. Uh, where they would do things and, and have the uh, astronaut that there at the um, at Atlantis Beach Lodge, Marty. Remember where that was on Cocoa Beach? The Atlantis Beach Lodge. Not sure where that is. Uh, they, they had pictures of the astronauts inside here. And uh, once in a while we run across some of these that have astronaut autographs on the back. And the final, oh, Skylab 4. All right, S4B208. The Wizard of Id got involved with a lot of Skylab uh, things, uh, as well as the, the Apollo. And we told you Gary Hart endorsed this. Uh, and this, the Wizard of Id writing some contraption uh, that was uh, a, a parody of the space station. But this would be uh, a detailed, this isn't a cartoon book. This is very detailed with charts and things uh, of the whole mission. These would be handed out to contractors, visitors at the Space Center. Uh, it even has uh, some schematics of the, the launch profiles and things like that that was going to do in there. So, But finally, one of my favorite things is this. And I love to, to display this. All right. Where you would get this from Martin Marietta, uh, uh, maybe in a, a bunch of NASA swag. And it opens up to tell you about, because uh, they were involved with building Skylab. And then it goes out, folds again. Okay. In more details and so forth. Now, these would be uh, really uh, worked up in the, in the day of the 70s. This was like doing a PowerPoint presentation in your pocket, okay? Because then you open it up like this, and then like this, okay? So here you have Skylab, all right, in, an, in a little one-sheet PowerPoint, if you will, of everything about the science mission of Skylab there, so... Thank you, Marty, for letting me share that swag with our friends out there. Uh, they may have remembered us. That was the way we did this show. And, boy, we have fun doing that uh, from time to time. Everything would go wrong. and and uh, But then a lot of it went right because you're still watching Stay Curious, and we do appreciate that. Let's uh, got a question. Yeah, uh, Dave Stangy, did all the Skylab command modules have the white painted on the side. Hmm. Well, also, Dave Stanky says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1996 was the last station wagon built. All right, Dave Stanky says, 1996, the last station wagon built. That's interesting. He talking about the white on there, Marty. Uh, that's a good one, Dave. Uh, that is a different look than the ones that went to the moon that uh, were silver, okay? Uh, so is this maybe uh, to uh, less heat absorption, Marty? We'll have to look into that. that that's a great I, uh, observation. When I saw that picture, that's what I noticed, but uh, I didn't think too much of it, but we'll look into that. Uh, 
1996, the last station wagon. That's 20, 26, 27 years ago. There's Bill Pogue and uh, Jerry Carr. So what this picture is all about is this is the crew one astronaut, Mike Hopkins on the left, Su Suchi Noguchi, uh, who's uh, on the, uh, 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 he's been on the space station before, Shannon Walker's there and Victor Glover, all right? They are talking with Skylab 4 astronaut, uh, Ed Gibson on the screen to mark their SpaceX Dragon resilience overtaking the command module of, of Skylab 4, 84 days for the U.S. flight record. Okay, so the resilience uh, drag crew Dragon, which I think they flew again, uh, has a, uh, 84 days in space that eclipsed the Skylab 4 command module. The astronauts on the International Space Station celebrated this on Sunday, February 7th, 2021, two years ago. And, uh, uh, I mean, that is, that is how cool is that? And there you see the logos there in the center of each of the crews and their dates. Uh, the Resilient crew was launched on November 15th, and November 16th was the day the Skylab launched in the 70s. So, um so where is the command module? There it is at the Smithsonian being refurbished, okay. But the this, this exhibit at the Oklahoma History Center explores the state's aviators and astronauts from Gordon Cooper to John Harrington, who we've had on our show, to Shannon Lucid. And uh, so Bill Pogue is also from Oklahoma. So it's appropriate his Skylab uh, for command modules there. Tom Stafford is from Weatherford. All right. And uh, the only person to fly in space twice in six months is General Tom. And uh, of course, John Harrington is from Wetumpka, the first Native American to go to space. Uh, Shannon Luce is also from Oklahoma. So uh, that is the command module in the back. And you see it does have still have some of that white on there. And, and that's a great question from our from Dave Stangy out there about what that's all about and, and gives us something to look at and stay curious about our friends. So, yes, question, Marty. No comment from Doug Forrest. The white was because there was no barbecue roll or thermal control while docked at Skylab. He says, I'm not sure about them all being painted white. I think that was the first one <clears throat> that did not have that. That would make a lot of sense, okay? And all, uh, like uh, Doug Forrest says there, the no barbecue roll where they're constantly turning it. It's it's in one place, so they must have put something on it to reflect uh, the heat. Yeah, Marty. Yeah, we know, uh, similar comment from P. Gubin. They were painted white because of the thermals, and it's easier to spot the micro meteorite impacts good so. all right well we appreciate that from you there too makes sense and yeah the micrometeorite impacts is it's a stationary target there uh, and they have plenty of those you better believe it there is our skylab uh and and you know of course it came down in 1979 uh we couldn't save it uh with the space shuttle hadn't flown yet uh what a waste uh, we had it up there it was cavernous we could have done years and years of science on that instead of three quick missions in about a year and a half but that was the way things were back in the 70s so well we hope you all make plans to come see us in april of course we'll be broadcasting that on our stay curious program and we're putting that program together now so stay tuned for that and then once again our memorabilia auction coming up a week from saturday november 18th you can see those 400 items up for auction right now. So, and tomorrow we're going to have uh, uh, Steve uh, Lloyd here. And Steve Lloyd, uh, his father worked on Apollo. He worked on the shuttle. And he's working now for a, a great company called All Point Steve Lloyd is, that is all about the future of America's great space age. So, Marty, thank you for a good job. Anybody else need to chime in? Any corrections or additions there? Appreciate everybody watching today. I didn't say hi to Deborah Johnson. Hey, Pam Shivick. Uh, Steve Hammer's watching. Tammy McDougal Miller. 
Cliff Watson down there in Pomona sent us another 100 stars. You are catching on to this star thing. We are getting some money from that. And you see, you send us stars. They're worth, uh, uh, I thought they were worth a penny a piece, but uh, about 400 stars Cliff sent us was worth 15 bucks. Adrian Paddock's watching. Mason Jamilio. Thank you, Mason. Good name, Mayor. And uh, Bill Whiting, great to see Bill. Staying curious, Tom Usiak, bragging about your artwork. Carlton Bailey, uh, he's got his critters circling his ranch out there where he lives to get fed. Hey, Mikey Haddad, hope you enjoyed staying curious today with us. And we enjoy everybody that enjoys our program. Uh, Marty gave us a great compliment today. Marty, where you heard some people just talking about us out at the... Uh, the space center today and uh they did they had no idea that you knew anything about it right so right they didn't know anything they didn't know who i was right and marty didn't say you know who i am yeah. no he, he they said did, they did think mark that you ran the museum oh so well that was kind of you straightened them out yeah as good a job as you do you don't quite run it good <laughs> well we're running what we can here and we're grateful of that and, and we're grateful under Karen Conklin's leadership that uh, everybody here at the museum is enjoying a lot of freedom, doing what they think they should do for outreach and it's working. So uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we want to get this Stay Curious program up there to a level that we think it deserves as where else did you get three astronauts on Black History Month, a little bio of them with some important space history of the days where we uh, ruled outer space and in fact i think think it took it about four years for the russians finally to break the 84-day barrier with their salute missions up there so well tomorrow like i said we got steve lloyd's going to talk about some unique areas of the shuttle era that you will want to definitely watch and stay curious about so until then i'm mark marquette saying i can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us